Good morning. I was nervous when I first walked in the room. It was so crowded. Now everybody can breathe better. So, <laughs> um, My name is Rika, and uh, one lesson that I learned in putting this talk together is don't try to name your titles at 11 o'clock at night. It's a terrible heading, so thank you for coming regardless. Uh, I wanted to talk more uh, specifically not about this not being your parents' transformation through AR, but I just watched uh, Blade Runner, the first one, re-saw it because I'm excited about the second one. And William Gibson, uh, who was inspired by Blade Runner, made a comment, and I'm not going to quote it exactly, but the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And uh, it seems to be something that stays very relevant with each generation of technology and next generation of computing. And what I'd like to talk about today is what we've been seeing at Ethere. Uh, many of those of us who are here today, whether we're ventures or corporations or VCs, have been in the space for a decade, a decade if not more. And there's a lot of uh, sort of back and forth between the people that continue to say it's really going to happen this year, what everybody is saying about AR, next generation computing is going to happen, and then meanwhile other people are saying, you know, it's so far out, there's just no way that it's going to happen in the way that you think it is. All these people that are putting money into the system just are being way too bullish. And what I'd like to talk about today is some of the trends that uh, indicate to us that it's, a, it's not an all or nothing proposition as much as we like to be binary in, in code and computing. It really is a mixed bag and uh, hopefully share with you some insights. Some of this I'm, I'm sure you've already seen because a lot of us here are drinking the Kool-Aid from the same, uh, from the same uh, bucket as it were and some of us are constantly trying to keep our eyes on the prize. So <clears throat> This year, 2017, new numbers came out, new infographics. Uh, Ori showed some great statistics this morning and showing about all the money that's going into the space. And what we are focused at at Ethere is we're focused on the industrial sector, which is very relevant for Germany and other Western nations that are being impacted by some trends that I'll talk about. So in terms of some numbers, uh, among other data that you've seen, uh, you know, Gartner says that the demand for uh, enterprise mobile applications is going to be five times greater than what is available to be deployed today. And if you think about uh, specifically with augmented reality, and we believe that the short term is really going to be about augmented reality and enterprise, is that by 2021, there'll be about 20 million headsets, so not quite 1 billion in terms of the, the numbers that Ori was talking about this morning, just generally speaking for us as we're thinking about industrial enterprise, really seeing the deployment of that being at some level within the next three years. But the point about that isn't really about what's the market size three years from now. It's about what are you doing today to participate in that growth. Uh, the same study says that the overall market will be about 114 billion com combination of, of hardware and software. And where we're focused at Ethere is, is in the software space, and I'll talk about that as well. So I said that there are some trends. Uh, there are three that uh, we think about very, very hard. Uh, we think about the next generations of computing. I was at, at uh, NVIDIA for four years, and at NVIDIA, I actually joined the mobile group when we were trying to do a discrete GPU on a board uh, before Jensen pivoted to what is now Tegra. And then I moved into the notebook business unit. And when I was in the notebook BU working for Rene Haas, that was the same year that notebook PCs outstripped desktop PCs. And everybody was saying, notebook is it, notebook is the answer. And so what notebooks did was notebooks enabled uh, the, the workforce to become much more mobile. And then we saw tablets starting to make its way into the corporate and mobile phones, of course, leapfrogging into that. And, uh, and now we're thinking about wearables. So regardless how you think about it, Head-mounted displays and smart glasses is a form of wearable. And if you juxtapose just the form factor of hardware with what's happening with cloud and IoT, that convergence really means that, the, that we're really at the at sort of where the next generation computing is redefining the way we talk about HMI. So HMI, when it was first coined, was human-machine interface. And the way that I talk about HMI today is human-machine integrate, however dystopian or otherwise that might sound. So there's that trend as we become more and more adapting to the notion of technology always being with you and perhaps designing yourself versus waiting for the environment to design around you. The second trend is that uh, millennials are starting to make up the majority of the workforce. And millennials are digitally savvy, 
They expect everything to be Apple-like. They expect everything to be automatically just ability to be connected to digital. So you have these two trends that are playing out. And just talking about on the, on the um, devices side, where we're focused at Ethereum is in the smart glasses. In fact, Ethereum in 2012, we started in smart glasses. But we didn't go into smart glass development or head-mounted display development to actually do that as a business. We just wanted to be able to make a reference design that demonstrated the way that workers were going to interact with digital accessibility through a device like smart glasses. So we've since pivoted to, to, uh, to software. But what this chart is showing is uh, you know, Pokemon Go and all the other applications, not as successful as Pokemon Go, but what has led to the, to the announcement of, of AR Core and AR Kit is really around taking advantage of the fact that everybody has a mobile phone in their pocket, and how does that become a device that enables applications in AR and enterprise. So what you see in the chart here is essentially the mobile AR replacement cycle being mobile devices as we have it today, being, re, uh, being um, recycled out for newer forms, maybe the Lenovo uh, phone or other uh, Tango-enabled devices, um, more and more devices coming into the market. And as you can see, the orange, which is where the smart glasses and a lot of the players are today, and some of them you can see on the exhibition floor, a lot of them are partners with, that, uh, with us at Ethereum, is really going to start growing probably 20, 2019, 2020, 2021. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how you look at it, whether, it's, whether you're being bearish or bullish about the market of applications of AR, and at the end of the day, it's just about changing uh, sort of the adaption and behavior of both the generations that are leaving the workforce, which I'll talk about, as well as the millennials coming in. It's all about where we are on that trajectory. And that's the thing that we have to be mindful of. And you can't jump in once the tsunami is cresting. You have to be there in the formation of the tsunami. And that's, that's the most important thing we believe today. So let's take a look at trend number three, uh, the baby boomers. So uh, the median age in Germany, can anybody guess what that is today, the median age? Anyone? It's 46. And it's only beaten by Japan, which I was just in. So my, I'm half German and half Japanese, so um, having that, those two combinations being part of sort of the graying society. Um, one in 20 Germans today are over the age of 80. And by 2050, that'll be one in six. So when you think about the baby boomers who are retiring, they're taking with them a lot of skills that took a number of years and experience and learning from the big, thick, heavy manuals, they're leaving with them. And there's two things about that. One is either they're done and they want to retire and they just don't want to do this anymore, or they just don't want to be in the middle of it. They want to go to rural parts of Germany or other parts of the US or other parts of Japan, any of these Western societies, but they still want to participate. They still want to be able to feel like they're being productive. I was in Pismo Beach in a hot tub about a year ago when um, there was this elderly couple and she kept complaining about how her husband, who used to work at the nuclear plant, keeps getting called back to the nuclear plant to show the new kids how to use stuff, getting paid six times more per hour than what he was making when he was working there. So trends like these are what, are, what is going to drive the need for augmented reality. You heard some use cases this morning. Something as simple as bread and butter as see what I see in remote collaboration. We're working with a very large German auto manufacturer that's also using Ethereum specifically for that reason. Instead of flying ex experts out, instead of allowing people to retire and never be able to leverage their skills and their learnings, it's being able to have them still involved and engaged in that. So, you know, some of these statistics are uh, scary for the Western countries where we are starting to see that drain. And that's also combined with a growing uh, shortage of skilled workers. In Germany alone, there's 1.8 million uh, shortage in skilled workers, and that's going to increase almost twofold by 2060. So the way that we think about this is AR is really a way for enterprises to take hold of what they're already going through is digital transformation, industrial 4.0. And what do they have to do? they have to think about what is the next iteration of that device that's going to transform the way that human machines integrate, let alone interface. They have to uh, cater to the millennials and the generations that are coming up behind them, by the way, right? the ones that are, that are sort of the, the digital first natives that are going to be quickly coming into the workforce. 
And they need to be able to leverage AR because the young kids that are coming into the workforce today have less patience, their bosses have less patience, highly competitive, highly performance oriented. There just isn't that level of patience anymore for people to get trained up. So how do you as an enterprise use AR to bridge that gap while also letting the 50-somethings, the 60-somethings, the 70-somethings who may want to retire, who may want to be remote, maybe they're just not even physically able to move around, but their cognition is still there and they're still able to see and be able to leverage that, uh, that uh, experience and that skill set. So we at Ethereum, we're just taking advantage of these, where we have a software application, it's a SaaS-based uh, platform called Air Enterprise that enables that remote collaboration, the training, the ability to have uh, files that are managed across an enterprise, uh, task flow management from a see what I see perspective. And we're taking advantage of all those different trends that are happening, seeing the problems that that's creating for enterprise class customers, and trying to figure out how we can get them to be able to bridge that divide quickly. And so the use cases that we look at, uh, the acronym is FAST, um, F-A-S-T. It's really about using AR to fix things, so reducing the downtime. You heard from this morning, downtime is the enemy for a lot of industrial jobs. And we see, you know, for example, uh, downtime could be $50,000 per hour for commercial airplanes. I know in automotive, downtime by minute could be in the millions, for example. I don't have the exact figures. But uh, downtime is the enemy. Assembling. So in assembly, you have a lot of room for error. How do you minimize the room for error? And how do you actually make uh, the assembly go faster so you can be more productive? Surveying. So instead of flying around uh, insurance inspectors or other casualty inspectors, you can actually use augmented reality to reduce the time for a ticket to be open from X number of days down to a fraction of that. And we've seen that through the deployments that we've had. And then training. So again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, is augmented reality is a tremendous way to be able to upskill your, uh, your workforce and to be able to have your elder generation still be uh, engaged with, with the new ones. But really what we're looking at, and again, I'm not here to say AR is gonna be $10 billion. I'm here to say, you know, we're still seeing it being very much a walk, uh, crawl, walk, run. Scenario, we think 2018 is actually going to be very, very interesting. Uh, at Ethereum, we're working on a couple partnerships that will be announced around CES, so hopefully I'll be able to share more of that when that happens. We're going to start to see more proliferation of smart glasses in the market. As you heard this morning, the designs, uh, so from a human-centered design perspective, a lot of that is going to be much more usable. Um, the other thing that we see in industrial enterprise is the, uh, the, the, the safety rating, right? So hazardous location safety rating, ANSI, uh, certified, all these things are going to be uh, taken into consideration by more and more designs that are going to be coming into the marketplace. And so that's on the enterprise and how they're thinking about how they're going to go into the space. But we also think that collectively, it's still a, a crawl, walk, run. Because from a trajectory perspective, while it might seem like we've been doing this for a long time for a lot of you that have been in it, it's just where we are in the trajectory. So one of the ways that we're looking at engaging successfully with enterprises, and, and usually it's a marriage between the IT team and a business unit, because the business unit owner ultimately owns the outcomes and the outputs of deploying new technology. And so for us, we look at this as initiating with an initial lab, so just trialing it out, proof of concept, identifying what are the problems, how is AR unique versus other problems, and what's the ROI that we're tracking towards. Then once that's been successful, we go out into the field. So we take some model of deployment that's been in the lab, as it were, not literally in the lab. It will be with a handful of people using glasses in the factory, on the, uh, on the maintenance floor, into field. And that's when we start exploring other aspects of deployment with ERP systems, for example. We know that ERP systems uh, have some legacy tie-ins and they need to be connected in somehow, and then we start to solve those problems. And then deploy. We deploy at scale, and there's a lot of uh, additional considerations around that. Highly, highly complex. The slide obviously doesn't do justice to how complex this is. But it really is still, from our perspective, a crawl, walk, run approach. And we're actively engaged a lot now in walk, and we're going to be getting to running. And what the business units in IT look for is essentially the ease of engagement. So how quickly can I turn this on? How automatic can I make it? has to be flexible, right? So there's different examples. So I was talking to uh, one customer and he said, 
we might use one headset to actually do something that's very specific to a task. And then I'll have glanceware, and he called it glanceware, which is glasses that you're going to be having on your face the whole time, like safety glasses on auto, uh, auto, uh, automaker floors today. And so it's going to really depend on what the specific need is. And oftentimes the glanceware is going to be considerably cheaper than a mixed reality headset, right? That's going to be heavier and, and clunkier for now. And UX, UX has to be great. And if anything that the leaders in technology did today and the gods of tech from this morning is showing how user-centered design has to be considered when you're thinking about machine-centered way of deploying an enterprise. And then of course ROI, tracking that, because ultimately it is an investment. And then future-proofing, um, things move really fast. How do we make sure that we're future helping our clients future-proof for new innovations? So just to summarize, um, and this is where at parties and you know, coffee conversations that I have with my colleagues, I'm based in Mountain View. So you can imagine that it's pretty monochromatic in terms of the kinds of conversations I have. It's always about where we are going with technology, usually. But what you have is when computing first came out, and this is a Hartwell computer, I think this is called the Witch, like gas, gas filled tubes and 2.5 metric ton machine. And that was the first sort of iteration of computing. Look at where we are now. And then mobile phone, the, uh, the Motorola device up there. Um, that was around 1983, 1984, and 1985. And, and I remember, I'm dating myself now, but people were, I knew people who had strapped around their arm or had it as a console in the car, and people were saying, why would I ever want to call somebody in the middle of the day? And then you look at where we are today. But again, that's a, that was from 1983, 84 to where we are today. I'm not sure if we'll ever get there, but if that's directionally where we're thinking about where we're going with AI, with IoT, with, uh, with, with robots, machines becoming a much more integral way of how we work, we're way early still. But you have to be in it to not just win it, but to be participatory in the program so that you can say, yeah, I was there when, back when we were creating these machines that took up a whole room and where we are today is it's a minute object or that's where I was when mobile phones were still lugged around and nobody really understood why it was going to be helpful. So there's a modicum of patience and practicality that has to go with anticipation and what people say is the art of the possible, I've actually now say what is the art of the tangible. But you have to start with the baby steps and some of us want those baby steps to be at the Olympic uh, level but uh, for us it's really about demonstrating the initial values and we can do that um, with, uh, with the ways that we are going to market with the lab field and deploy model. So that's, uh, that's it for me. Uh, there's my information there. I'm based in Mountain View and happy to talk to any of you about the journey that we've been at here, going from hardware to software and working with enterprise cost customers today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.